Anyone uses GXT ready for Christmas? So it turns out I get to be Santa Claus today. So for those of us who haven't yet gotten a copy of GXT 3.1, this is still a preview. We're not finished, as you're probably going to notice. There's a handful of bugs. There's a few things we'd still like to change. But we'd like to hand this out to anyone who hasn't yet gotten a copy. Now we're running a little low on copies, but uh, I'm going to hand out piles of them, just kind of distribute them in your area. Yeah, now you got to work. You didn't think you'd have to come to the talk and work, did you? Just a couple in the area. And we're running low. All right. I'll give you a couple, yeah. Yep. Just pass them down the line. Yes, Share with your colleagues if you can. Uh, see if you can get one from somewhere in the area. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a very good Christmas if everyone doesn't get something, is it? You guys a couple? I got uh, four more. You have, you want to trade? Wait, did I give you a Chromecast, really? Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I, Can you give us two or three? <laughs> <laughs> For the Chromecast, might be worth it. If no one's used a Chromecast yet, they're a little bit of fun to develop on. I've actually got GWT running on this correctly. Uh, it runs basically a modified copy of Chrome, and it's not too hard actually to get GXT running on it either. Uh, with the classic blue and gray theme, it doesn't look too great, but with the generated themes, it looks pretty good. So maybe we'll show that later if we get a lot of free time. All right, a couple more. Uh, oh boy, a lot more. We're going to have to share. All right. Oh. All right, and if you can use it and pass it down, if you've got a laptop, that'd be great. I'm sorry, guys, that's it. This is one of the problems of having a great, successful conference. We've got so many people here, so many things to pass out. Um, we only spent uh, three or four hours filling these things up, so uh, we, we, we didn't quite get enough of them for everybody. So, oh, we've got a couple here to share. A couple here to share. Nobody wants to share? Yeah, you got lucky then. <laughs> All right, so who before they got these thumb drives has used GXT at all? And have you guys, okay, how many people were using GXT2 and GXT3? Okay, so some people have updated. Um, it's a big step to move from 2 to 3, and we're going to talk about that a little bit just in terms of what are we going to do going forward. It's a big step, but we think it's worth it. GXT3 really does bring a lot more of the the standard GWT functionality we expect and opens you up to a lot of the other toolkits out there. The GWT P, uh, MVP for G, Arai. We're starting to use standardized data objects that everyone else can speak. And as, uh, as we mentioned the other day, GXT3 has been out for now uh, about a year and a half. So we think, it's, we think it's a good time to be moving. We're pretty stable at this point. We're pretty happy with where we ended up. So, my name is Colin Allworth. I work with Sencha on the GXT project. I was a customer for a number of years. Prior to that, I wrote handwritten JavaScript. Anyone here ever written handwritten JavaScript? It's like 5,000 lines of code. Just keep your hands up. 10,000, 20, 40, 50. Okay, we got up to a 40,000 line library and another 15, 20,000 lines in the application itself. And it works if you've got a full-time team who everyone knows the ins and outs of JavaScript and spends all day learning what exactly is broken this time. But as Ray mentioned, this was a number of years ago, and, and the world has changed since then. The browsers have become less inconsistent, which is not to say more consistent, but less bad. So uh, I moved to a company then where I was using GXT for a while, uh, trying to figure out how do we make it easy for Java developers who are working on the server to just automatically write client code. And that turns out not to work so well either. You've actually got to have people who are aware of the DOM or aware of the fact that we're actually writing HTML at the end of the day. So this is why we come to conferences. This is why we come to discuss things like this, to say, how do we, how do we think about solving these problems? How do we think about the UI problem in general? And my main goal when joining Sencha to write GXT3 was to pick up the various inconsistencies between GWT and, at the time, GXT2 and try to bring them together more and to just generally make it easier for all the developers out there who, who want to be able to think about building applications, but don't want to focus on the DOM, instead want to focus on what am I building in the application? What's the basic user interface we need to worry about? So I'm going to talk about today 
what we have in GXT, what, what we can do for you, uh, what things you can leverage to build your applications. So what is GXT? This is more of a, almost a marketing slide than, a, than an actual description for all of you here. But hopefully we all know at this point, it's a Java library for building rich applications. So who thought before we got in here today that GXT is all written in JavaScript with a Java wrapper? All right, we are head and shoulders above the San Francisco class. We had about half people there who thought we were a JavaScript library. We're a pure Java library. Everything's written in Java. We don't have any external JavaScript. We don't have any third-party libraries we include to do this. Any third-party JavaScript libraries we include to do this. Uh, there tend to be high-performance, customizable UI widgets. We're seeing significant performance improvements over GXT2. Um, of course, not as fast as drawing uh, individual inputs or single tags on the page. But this is the price we pay for consistency across IE 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and of course Firefox and Chrome. Well-designed, consistent, and fully documented layouts. This is one of the wonderful things about living in the GWT world. The GWT compiler needs source code in order to do its job correctly. So the libraries we distribute have to include all of our source code. In that source code, then, are the comments we use to figure out how things work. If you want to understand why something's happening, you can step into GXT. Your IDE will follow you there and will tell you what's going on so you can figure out uh, what might be wrong either in your code, in our code, lets you track it more easily than some libraries that don't include the source code. Built-in support for RPC, Request Factory, XML, JSON over AJAX. So these are various ways of communicating client and server. Uh, who here is using RPC? Request Factory? Small handful, OK. How many people are using something else, whether it's XML, JSON, or your own invention, or protocol buffers, something else magical? At the end of the day, we all need to be able to talk to the server. We're building applications that are dealing with data. And if we can't get data from the server, and we can't let the user edit it, and then can't send it back to the server, we're, we're all stuck no matter how we're doing it. So GXT has some generalized concepts to abstract out the server from the rest of the components. So you can implement however you want to do it, whether it's AJAX, WebSockets, any particular AJAX implementation. Let you decide how you're talking to the server. We can interact with that mechanism. Uh, full theming support with standard CSS. So this was already a point we had to say, we're using CSS. We have CSS classes decorating everything to allow you to go and customize features, customize styles. For those of us who went to the appearance talk yesterday, we explained exactly how we do this and how we're making it even more customizable going forward with the theme builder. I'm very happy with what we have in the theme builder. I hope some of you have had a chance to try it out. Uh, if not, we'll do a workshop right after this talk where we can go through and try things out, see what we can make happen. So it's even more customizable than when we originally wrote these slides. And we do provide commercial licenses or the open source license and then commercial support. So if you have problems with GXT or even GWT, we'd be happy to help you. So out of the box, again, as I mentioned during the keynote, we have a variety of widgets that focus on how do we interact with the user. Uh, buttons, of course, are the sort of the easy one. You can actually click on it. Panels are the, the ones that don't, you don't actually interact with, but they decorate the page in some way. And then there's the fields, the grids, trees, tree grid, list view, that all bind to some large store of data and allow you to display it in some consistent way. The charts are something we're particularly proud of a way to define exactly what you need to draw on the page. We've got a number of aspects of this that are customizable, and we're working to make it even better. We, you assign one or more axes to say, on this side, I've got months. These are categories. Please group the data accordingly. On this side, I have the various values. Uh, here's, here's how I want you to display the text. Here's how I want you to display the numbers, to uh, print the numbers, depending on locale, depending on values. And then we've got an, a series drawn through here where it takes some model, and each instance of the model in the store gets displayed differently, and all these different uh, objects linked up correctly. Has anyone used our charting library? Anyone used the draw library that's underneath the charting library? We've built a drawing library that lets you draw consistently uh, across all browsers. In, in the older browsers, we have VML, uh, and in newer browsers, we have SVG. And the drawing library abstracts out all the details between these. And all the charts are built on top of this. That way, when you write a chart, you don't have to do any thinking at all about which browser you're on. You just use the underlying charting library. For 3.1, I've been working on a Canvas implementation of this. 
which is not yet ready. It may or may not make 3.1. It will definitely not be active by default, but it will definitely be ready for GXT4. Uh, the canvas lets you draw faster in some situations, but it's not a vector graphics library. Uh, it very much is about pushing individual bits to the screen. So something to look forward to, something we don't quite have finished yet. So when we look at the particular features, specifically looking around the data, we have models and server communication. Now this is kind of a poor title. For those of us who have used GXT2 in the past, we know we always had to implement either base model data or model data, or we had to use the Bean Model API to translate between our real Java objects and objects that GXT could support. There's no longer a concept of this in GXT3. Anything that is a Java object is a model as far as GXT is concerned. We still call them models because it's a convenient way to refer to the idea, but we don't have any requirements on how your models are shaped. Stores and loaders, how do we get data from the server? How do we hang onto it locally, do some simple manipulations, track changes, and then make it available to the templated widgets? We've got some standard widgets which just draw on the screen. We've got some templates which allow you to customize exactly how you're drawing data. And then cells and cell widgets. Who's used cells, whether in GWT or in GXT? The cell table, cell tree, cell browser, or the GXT grid, list view, uh, other widgets like that. The cells are ways of drawing data very quickly uh, in a lightweight fashion that uh, are still interactable. It, it means you have to work a little harder as the developer to build the API. But once you've done so, you can draw very, very efficiently. UI binder. Who uses UI binder? We saw about half in the other room we were discussing. Who uses the GWT designer? OK, about two people. All right. Um, for the most part, I prefer to write in Java, but I know that isn't the case. A number of my colleagues far prefer to write in UI binder. We want to make either style of writing code as easy as possible. So full UI binder support. We actually made a few changes to GWT 2.5.0 to make this easier so that we could write objects that had various configurations that weren't possible previously. So this is part of GWT 2.5 and going forward. Layouts, we'll discuss very briefly. Who has either loved or hated the GWT or, or GW, oh, sorry, the GWT or GXT layouts? Loved or hated, you can fall in both categories. If you've used them, it's been one or the other. Question or just raising? OK, you've used them. Um, and then charting, this is something we just mentioned very briefly. Uh, and I'd love to go in more depth on it once we get in the other room and keep this discussion going. So models and server communication, what exactly does this entail? Let's get a little more depth. Full support for any POJO. This is new in GXT2. As far as we're concerned, if it looks like an object, if it extends from object, which is practically anything, it's a model as far as we're concerned. Which means now, in addition to RPC, we can easily support request factory or auto beams. Um, the data stores take any data type. They're generic on anything. And this lets you say, I actually do want a store full of doubles. I've actually seen one use case where this makes sense to say, here's a list store. It's full of doubles. I really want to display numbers on the screen. And the useful option for that was saying, OK, take all these numbers. And actually, they were very simple numbers. It was 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, very boring numbers. But display them in a chart. So use one axis as just exp exactly displaying the numbers themselves, and then the other axis with a function to say, draw in some other way, draw a sine curve, draw. We basically built a graphing calculator out of GXT. Um, so how do we transport these back and forth? RPC, we had a lot of people using RPC. Typically, this looks like pure Java on both the client and the server. Uh, on both sides, we're looking at the objects as objects. And we like to ignore any of the details about how we're sending and receiving it. As long as we don't mark something as final or static or transient, it'll make its way over the wire. And once you get to the far end, it turns back into a real object. We'd like to be able to add those to a store and make them visible. By and large, this solves a lot of problems, and it solves it very quickly without us having to understand that we're running on JavaScript, we're running in the browser. Request Factory lets us take another step and say, well, the data I have on the server is different than the data I have on the client. I only want to bring some features down, but I want to do all the copying in an automatic way. Uh, personally, I find Request Factory fits very well for some specific use cases, but once you wander too far outside of that, it may not fit quite as well. The data type in that case is uh, either an entity proxy or a value proxy. These are both auto beans. These are all interfaces. You implement it. You don't even implement an interface. You describe an interface with getter and setters. And that's enough for the GXT code to go in 
and find the properties and correctly display them on the page. And then we can go one step lower still and talk about request builder or talk about web sockets and just send strings over the, uh, the, the connection. Somehow you get a string of stuff, it might be XML, it might be JSON, and we need to turn that XML or JSON or protocol buffers or whatever it be into some kind of data. And the usual approach we have that's built into GXT is using AutoBeans and AutoBean Factory to do this. It's a very simple way of describing an interface with getters and setters that you can send back and forth over the wire. Let's do questions at the end or in the other room, please. Thanks. We have this value provider interface. Maybe I'll jump ahead a slide or two to show this real quick. Back up, there we go. The value provider is a simple way of describing a getter and setter, a field or a property inside of an object. From the perspective of GXT, we need to be able to say, in a single column of a grid, we've got a larger grid we're drawing, within a single column, I want a title, and I want to display some feature of each object in each cell all the way down. Maybe it's the name of the user. We saw a little bit of that from the Vaden demonstration. Maybe it's the user, maybe it's the address. Somehow we have an object, we need to get this piece out. Now in GWT we don't have reflection, so we can't go in and get that directly, which is, turns out to be a good thing. It would cause much, much larger application code size. So we need to describe this in some way. The API looks like this. It's an interface, it has three methods. The two that we actually care about here are, if I give you an object, can you give me the value? If I give you a person object, give me back the name of that person. And we keep invoking get value on every single item in the grid, and it displays just the name then in every single cell. And then set value, of course, works the other way around. If I give you an object and a new value to assign, please invoke the right setter. Now, who would be driven nuts by the idea that they would have to implement one of these interfaces for every single property of every single bean across their entire application? Few people. Okay, so a few people don't write, like to write meaningless code over and over again. I'm glad to hear that, because uh, we spent a little bit of time building this property access that lets you say, I have this object, it's a post, and there's no way to describe explicitly what we need to use in it, but I can tell you what I'm going to be using. I want to access the username field, and I want to get a string in and out of that, and I'd like to access the forum field, and this will be a getter and setter again, and then a date field. Now, if I don't have a setter, these will automatically generate read-only objects. And if you invoke set value, it's going to warn you, hey, by the way, you didn't actually do anything there. You just called setter and the data got lost. And that's up to you and your own application to make sure you get this uh, wired up correctly. But if you do have it both read and writable, this will generate an object that can read and write all these different pieces. So to build these, we use gwit.create to say, generate all these properties for me. And then as I'm constructing column configs, I say props.form to say, here is how I want you to look at the post object, get a string out of it, and display it on the page for every single cell in this column. So very briefly, it allows access to the, actually, I made a miss a section? No, that's it. It allows access to the object's property, whatever that property may be. Supports a string-based path. So it turns out if you've got a person, and the person has an address, and the address has a line one, and in your grid you'd like to display the person's address's city, or the person's address's line one, you can specify in this property access, I would like address.line1, or address.city. So we've got these uh, nested properties using a string-based path. You can also create them directly, because they are interfaces. You can implement them directly. This is great for people who, would, who don't know at compile time what data they're going to be displaying. They've just got some meta model that comes from the server that says, here are the different columns that the server has told you you need to display. And then they get some map of string to object, which contains all the possible properties. In this case, you can implement value provider once that says, here's how you read out the string value and return, or here's how you use the string field to return the object that has to be displayed in the grid. At the end of the day, it's just an interface. As long as you implement the interface, it'll all work correctly. So stores and loaders, we've got a way of talking about data, reflecting over data in a very efficient, uh, compact way once we get to the client. It's basically very simple, uh, compiled reflection. Stores and loaders are how we look at more than one piece of data at a time. A store is a client-side collection of data. Now, a lot of people try to use stores almost as little databases. They're not designed to be little databases. They're intended to be 
more of a cache, more of a backing for the view. So if I'm drawing a grid, what information is in that grid is in the store. If I remove something from the store, the automatically the item disappears from the grid. If I add something else or I modify an object in the store, it automatically updates what the user is looking at. Likewise, if I perform some transformation to the full store, like sorting all the items, it'll automatically reorder. And the grid itself is able to do this. The grid can say, when you click on a header, go ahead and reorder all the items. It'll sort all the items and then display them again. Now, if you've got 50 pages of items, because you're only displaying 100 items per page, and you've got 5,000 items you'd like to track, if you sort just the local items, that's not going to be very helpful for the user. So we've also got the concept of don't do the sort locally, but ask the loader to go get more items, go get a different set of items that are sorted correctly. And through this, it's important that your server decides exactly how does it do its sorting. Does it load all objects from the database, sort them all, and then slice out a few and send them back? Or do we use SQL to actually say, order by this, limit by this, send me some items, I'll give them to the client. It's up to you exactly how you implement that, whether you're using SQL, whether you're using one of the NoSQL options out there, whether you're doing it all in memory. So the store supports filtering and sorting locally. It will fire change events. This is how the grid listens to say, something has happened, you need to make sure to update accordingly. Something was added, removed, updated, committed, reverted. It can accept any data type. You can have a store that is just full of strings. You can have one that's full of doubles. But more frequently, it's going to be useful to store your actual domain objects. And then the data widgets are then bound to these stores. You can have a chart bound to a store simultaneously as a grid bound to a store. You can have multiple combo boxes that use a store to say exactly what items do I have when I click on the drop down and see the different options. We have both list store which is naturally a list of items. And then we have a tree store, which, a which is a hierarchical set of items. Your objects don't actually need to track how the hierarchy is formed. You can have the items just take care of themselves and then use the store to say, here's a parent, here's a child, establish the relationship. The store will make sure nothing silly happens, like adding a child to itself or uh, having larger loops throughout the system, or having an item appearing in more than one place in the hierarchy. It does this tracking for you. So now we want to load items. We want to have some way to go and get things from the server. And from the perspective of all of our views, the loader is the, is the, is the entire server mechanism. The loader is what we say, go get things. We specify, here is the description of how I want you to go get things. The offset, start at number 50. The limit please give me 50 more items. Um, it may specify other options such as the sort order. How exactly do we order those items when they come back? We may specify options like uh, filtering. Please don't include any item with this value. Please include all items with the range this value to this value. Beyond the loader, we need a way of actually going and getting the data. The data proxy is an interface that describes this. It actually makes the real request to the server. Now, because this is just an interface, you can implement it however you want. If you would like to not go to the server, but look at another local cache, a larger local cache, perhaps using local storage, that's very easy to do. A reader, then, is a way of transforming wire format into real objects. This is not always used, but for those of us who are using uh, protocol buffers, uh, XML, or JSON, this is going to be one option there. And then data writer is a way to say, well, I've got a config, and I need to write it to some customized format in order to send it to the server. So how do all these different pieces go together? We've got the loader. So a config, uh, sorry, a, uh, a grid might say sort on this field. We can't sort locally. We've got to sort remotely because we need a full new set of items. And the loader then sends the request to the data proxy. The data proxy knows how to talk to the server. If we're using RPC, it's going to go ahead and make an RPC call here off to the server, who's then going to return results back to the data proxy and say, here's my items. The data proxy interface includes one method that says, here's the config I want you to use. Here's the data, effectively, I want you to find. And here's a callback. Invoke it when you're done. So it's asynchronous. Any method you use to get data, whether it's synchronous or, or asynchronous, will work correctly with this then. You can invoke the callback immediately, or you can wait until the server has finished all its work and then has come back and notified. And then once the data proxy has its data, it usually passes off to the loader. So all we have here is a simple way to break out widgets that want to load items and don't really know how to talk about loading. 
And then we've got the data proxy, which actually knows how to talk about the server, but doesn't really understand all the different configuration options. We break these two pieces apart. Now, if you happen to be loading up uh, uh, some, from some kind of uh, HTTP proxy or WebSocket, you're probably just going to get a raw string back from the server. The data proxy doesn't know how to deserialize that. And we've got one other option here. We can say, pass the data through a reader, break it from a string into actual objects, whatever that breakdown happens to be, and then pass it off to the loader. And the wiring for this tends to be pretty simple. Usually you solve the problem once in your application, once you've decided how to communicate with the server, and then you use it everywhere. So in this case, we're looking at uh, a simple AJAX call to the server. We're saying, build a request builder. This is a standard GWT class that's going to use get, and it's going to go to this path and get some results back. And all we do is we wrap the HTTP proxy around that request builder and say, when I need data, this is how I'm going to go get it. Because this is an HTTP proxy, we're just talking strings over the wire. There's no way to describe to HTTP, well, the string you're getting back is actually JSON. It actually follows this particular format. Work it out for me. So instead, we use a reader. And the reader goes through and says, OK, based on the auto bean factory, based on the type of data I'm expecting back, here's how you turn things back into uh, data again. Now, for those of us who have used JSON, you know that you have to actually wrap everything up in an object. And usually, that extra object on the outside is not very useful once you actually get into your application. So we want to strip some of those pieces off. So we have this create return data that takes the full record collection and then grabs the values that are inside of it to pass it back out in the format that the list, sorry, that the loader is expecting. So we've got a uh, proxy. We've got a reader. Last piece we need is a data loader. How do we actually describe how the data can be talked about so the rest of the application can go and get it through this little window. We create a list loader in this case. There's lots of generics to specify exactly what are you sending and what are you receiving. These generics make sure you can never accidentally attach a list loader to an HTTP proxy without a reader in the way. The generics will complain and say, this doesn't make any sense, and then you can add the reader. Likewise, you can't say, well, in this uh, API over here, I'm going and reading from the server a person object, while over here I'm reading an email object. You don't want to accidentally cross wire uh, and get class cast exceptions. These generics make sure that isn't possible. Your compiler will catch you. Your IDE will catch you. And your IDE may even encourage you to use the right option. It may suggest for you which type it is you're trying to use. In order to wire the loader to the store, we just add a handler to it. This name uh, follows the Java convention that we all know and love of just kind of making names a little longer to describe exactly what it is it does. This is a load result list store binding. It gets a load result, and it binds it to a list store. When a load result comes in, pass it to the list store, replace all the items with it, and we're done. And the list store then does the rest of the work. Because it was told to replace its items, it tells all the widgets that are listening to it, a grid, list view, combo box, chart, that the items have changed in a dramatic way, clear everything you have, and redraw them. We can pro programmatically invoke loader.load. We can also say loader.load with a config object. Typically, your widgets will do this for you. But to get things going at the beginning of the application, you do the wiring, and then you decide when the application first goes and gets data. You don't want all of your grids across your application going and loading data as soon as the application gets started. You'd prefer to say, now I'm ready for this, or I want to start loading this instantly, because as soon as the grid is visible, I want it to have the data already. Or maybe you say, wait until the grid is actually visible. Let it be blank for a moment, because I'd rather move all these latency issues later in my application. We don't dictate a lot of these things to you. We allow you to design your application in the way that makes the most sense for your use case, for your users. Is latency a problem? Would you rather have fast application startup time? You get to decide this for yourself. Finally, we got the data writer. This is a way that when you're using these AJAX calls, when you're sending strings to the server and getting strings back, you need to convert your configs to some kind of a data writer. Or sorry, to some kind of a string. Uh, we've got three ones that we include by default. Let's turn our data into JSON, so you can easily post it. Let's turn our data into XML. Once again, you can easily post it as the body. Or if you happen to be making a get call so that all your calls can be cached easily, you can use the URL encoding writer. It'll take the config object, you get it, and try to encode as much of it as a URL as possible, and then send it off to the server. <coughs> so when most people think of GXT, they don't think of the data manipulation pieces as much. They think of the widgets. 
And to a lesser degree, we think of the X templates. Who here has used X templates in either XJS, GXT2, or 3? They turn out all to be the same language. It's a slightly more, um, it's a slightly simpler language than UI Binder because there's no widgets. It's a slightly more powerful language than either UI Binder or safe HTML templates because we've got loops, we've got conditionals, we've got the ability to do string formatting in a variety of different ways. And then on the other side, then we've got widgets, which are the bread and butter of GXT, the fields, the grids, pieces like that, the layout containers, the layouts. So in, in GXT3, X templates are compile time. You build them either in a separate HTML and then attach them to a file by referencing them through a source annotation, or you build them in the same file itself. You put an X template annotation and you specify the contents in that X template annotation. And the compiler looks at that at before it gets finished and looks at all the for and all the if statements and generates those into Java for and if, generates all your references into Java references and then lets the compiler do its work on that. If it ends up deciding something like this thing here is a constant, it'll go ahead and inline the values for you and does that at compile time as well. It can retrieve data from any Java bean. And when I say that, what I really mean is anything with getters and setters. So provided you've got getters, it can automatically seek out and invoke all the calls you've, you've already put up for it. So here's an example. It's just HTML for the most part. I do have a few things where I'm using the curly brackets to reference some incoming data. That data has a get name. Let's go ahead and call that, splice the data in there. Data also has something called income. It's either dot income or dot get income. And that's going to be a number of some kind. And I want to use the current user's currency formatting, whether that's locale specific or if you've just hard coded it to one specific value, to format that data before we print it on the page. Then two lines later, we've got a template tag that says loop through all of the kids inside of data. And for each one, use their age property and their parents' name and their own name to, and the date to display something. The pound is a magic value that says, give me the one index based item here. Why one indexed? How many people here display zero index data to their users? They display row number is number zero. Oh, that's weird. OK. Oh, we got one person. OK. So it does have to happen from time to time. Fortunately, we do support math to say, go ahead and subtract one. But by far, the 99% use case is that we actually want to display starting with one to the user. And here's how we wire that up. Here's uh, an interface that said, here's where you can find that source. It's in another file called template HTML. It's already got the contents here. Then we declare an interface method that says we pass in this person. The person is called data as far as the template's concerned, which is why we can reference data throughout here. And I want you to send me back some safe HTML. We'll use that safe HTML to draw perhaps a cell, perhaps to stick it in an HTML widget. Turns out we can also reference uh, CSS resources. Anything that has the method name that we called it up here, so name could either be get name, or if it's a Boolean, is name or has name, or it could just be something called name. So because we've got the search item, we can pass in a style and we can reference, as we see here, it's an inline uh, template, we can reference style.searItem to say, go and grab the search item string from the CSS resource. That this enables us to compile our CSS and inline it here as part of the template. Widgets, all of our fields are cell-based. So people have used cells a little bit here. We're attributing some significant part of our 50% uh, performance gains in GXT3 to switching to cells for everything, rather than manually manipulating DOM elements and stitching them together and then sticking them on the page. We're going ahead and building the whole string of HTML at once, usually using templates, and then displaying them all at once. This also means that since all of our fields wrap cells and our cells wrap appearances from yesterday's talk, each field can be displayed as a widget on the page as part of a form, or you can take the cell and display it as a widget, or sorry, display it in a data widget, perhaps as a column in a grid. And then you can use the same instance to display many different pieces of data. And I think I'm going to touch on that more in just a moment. The fields, all GXT fields work with the GWT editing framework. So this means if you define an editor of type person, you just need to have a text field of type name, maybe another text field that's mapped to address.line1, a double field that refers to 
some other property of the user, an integer field that refers to their uh, age, a date field. As long as these are uh, named fields that map to properties inside the person object, the editor framework automatically wires these things back and forth. Anyone using the editor framework? People with large fields, are you just manually wiring, calling getting, get this property, set it in the field then, whether it's GWT or GXT for the most part? Okay, a few more hands. I mentioned cells, and I mentioned cell to widgets briefly before. We have a lot of cells in, GW, in GXT. This is actually just a very small list. Uh, I think it's at least twice or three times as many, including all the various cells that we have. Any field or any button currently supported in GXT is represented by a cell so that we can do fun things like this. We can have a grid that displays all the different uh, all these different things, a slider, a color picker. These are actually just one object for all the different items in here. And it just renders itself more than once automatically. And this is a recording that goes through and plays with things, clicks on things, demonstrating that we can sort back and forth. Rendering is extremely fast because we're just concatenating together strings. We can very easily replace the entire contents of the grid all in one go and display something on the order of thousands of cells per second. No matter how complicated they get, there doesn't seem to be much of an upper bound. Uh, our most complicated cell is probably either the uh, one of these two on the end, and it doesn't seem to matter much which one you're playing with. They, uh, they both can render easily a thousand times per second. Uh, the, the basic cell widgets we have are the tree, which lets you have a hierarchical view of one cell, and you can display each item differently based on the, your own cell's logic or using one of our existing cells. We also have a tree grid, and then the list, uh, the list store uh, backed cell widgets are the list view in the grid. To say I want to display one property in a list view, or I want to display many properties in a grid, and then have more control like we're seeing here with sorting and then editing. These are all built-in features of the grid. In GXT2, we allowed you to draw widgets inside of the grid, and a lot of people love this feature, to be able to say, I need a field here, and I want to draw a field here, and here, and here, and for the next 100 rows. And maybe I want to do that in two or three columns. So I want to display 300 widgets inside of the panel. This turns out to be pretty expensive. So we've removed this functionality, but by and large, we're finding anyone who needed that functionality has been perfectly OK with drawing cells instead. Here's how we actually build a column config with a cell to do some custom functionality. The column config building itself is the same as it is before. I've left that simple. Uh, there's actually generics that have to be in there. There's actually a property that has to be in there, but we discussed that earlier. In GXT2, we would set up, oh, sorry, this is two different versions. This is two and three in one slide. The first column config is GXT2, how we would do that. We would set up a renderer. That renderer would be responsible only for drawing and would have no ability to listen to events. In GXT3, instead, we say, here's a column config. Here's the generics we use to say, what data is the entire row? It's the plant. And then for this particular column, it's just a string. Here's the properties that you're going to be accessing, the name to say, read out the plant's name and display it in this piece. It's 100 pixels wide. The title should say name. And then we've got a button, a text button cell. And to that button, we're adding a select handler. So the normal events you have on all your fields, we've implemented on your cells as well. And you can ask, which uh, row did this event happen on? And I can't actually move my mouse. Oh, that's just going forward. <laughs> can't actually use my, use my mouse over here. But we can read the context out, which is how each cell was rendered, specifying the row and column. And you can find out which row you were on when that event happened get the full object from the store, and then do something with it to delete it, perhaps. Delete button is very common in grid. Or in this case, we're just displaying a pop-up. Not very useful for most applications. Assigning the cell is just a matter of making sure your generics match. A text button cell is a uh, cell of type string. Because this is a column config that uses string as its actual data, you just say column config set cell button. The generics make sure you can't wire up something that doesn't make any sense. UI Binder. We had about half the room using UI Binder. We've got full support for this in GXT3. Declarative user interfaces via XML. This is the basic premise of UI Binder. We don't have any support for loops. We don't do conditionals. All we do is let you say, what do you want drawn in an XML format? So you can see the hierarchy very cleanly. 
and then go ahead and generate widgets out of that. This, in a lot of applications, lets people say, here's the logic, here's all the handler wiring, here's how I call back to my presenter, or I actually get work done. And then over in the XML file, say, here's exactly what I'm drawing. You can typically modify one without having to worry about the other one, except when you add new fields or remove uh, fields. And then here's a quick example where we've made a container. It's a center layout container. Inside that center layout container is a content panel which has a specific size assigned to it and then the simple text, I should be rendered. We do have to configure namespaces at the top to say where we're gonna find each of these packages. So we've got the one visible here for UI. This is the default wiring for UI binder. But because we've got container and GXT, we would also have to configure namespace that specify where to find the container widgets, where to find the GXT widgets. Uh, for the most part, Eclipse is gonna do this for you. It's gonna figure out where these things are. It'll auto-complete those imports as you start modifying that top section. Layouts. So once again, show of hands, who has either loved or hated layouts, either in GWT or in GXT, fair number of people. This is a difficult topic. Um, I find this to be one of my most rant-worthy topics about GWT, GXT, application development in general when we're using the web because most of our application frameworks in the world, outside of the web, have some standardized way of solving this problem. You basically say, how big is the window? How big is the stuff we put inside? These frameworks are usually built to say, your window is only this big, and you fix the size of it. But we can't do that in browsers. The user can always resize. You usually also have ways of saying, fill 100% of the width and the height. Take up all the available space. Anyone try to do that with CSS? Yeah, it, it doesn't do what you expect. You can also want to say, well, I've got a panel over here that's going to take 100 pixels because it's the sidebar, it's where some editing gets done. And then the main region, I want to fill up all the available space. In CSS, if you've got 400 pixels of width to work with, and you say, take 100 pixel or 200 pixels off to the side, and then have the main region fill up 100% of the remaining space. CSS, does it work just like that? Can you raise your hand if it works? No, no, the 100% turns out to be all of the available width. And then that other part on the side, it also consumes its space. So you, whatever you're drawing never fits correctly. This makes no sense from the application perspective because HTML and CSS is a tool designed to write not applications, but documents. It's designed to let us very easily make a document where you start at the top and work your way down, hypertext notwithstanding. We want to be able to make it very easy to say, here's a paragraph, here's an image inset in that paragraph, here's another paragraph. Maybe we'll have something float to one side or the other. Maybe we'll control how wide something can get. Maybe we'll do a little bit of positioning work. But by and large, we're always talking about a case where the entire page has one single scroll bar along it, either the top, bottom, or sorry, the, the, the bottom or the side, to be able to say, how do we maneuver ourselves? How do we change our viewport within this larger document? How do we shift what it is we're looking at of this whole piece? Applications, on the other hand, think about all the applications you use that aren't actually editing documents. They usually have one or more scroll bar. They have each section, each little document has its own scroll bar to figure out exactly what you're editing in that case. So there are documents inside of applications, but applications are not themselves documents. You, you have no other applications on your, on your computer, on your phone, that use full page scroll bars. So we need to change how we think about drawing things back and forth. And this is not something I can fit into even a one hour talk. This is something I usually do in training for at least four to six hours to go through all the different intricacies of how you may want to think about these problems. And then of course, exactly what does GXT provide to you to get this worked out. But the very gi simple gist of it is that we start with a viewport. We have a widget at the top. In GWT, this is the root layout panel plus the one feature of telling you when the application is finished starting so it's time to pick your initial size. The GXT version viewport says, here is the available space you have in your browser, and turn off the browser scroll bars because we don't want them. We're not writing documents for the most part. We're writing applications. Take that space and pass it to the child. Now, the child might be a, uh, a, a border layout container. You might have a header along the top a region along the side, something over here. And maybe those are fixed width. Maybe that's the simplest case. Some fixed height here, some fixed width here, and assign all the rest of the space. To 
the main region. So as I resize the browser, those two pieces keep their height and width the same, but the header will get additional height, the footer will get additional width, and it will be notified that these have changed so it can update anything accordingly. And then the main region will get both height and width changed as the browser size continues to change. So let's go a step further. Instead of there, let's put a container that lets us stack items next to each other. And I want 50%, 50%, and then all the remaining space. Or sorry, and then uh, some, some fixed amount off to the side. Sorry, that already is all the remaining space. We can't do 200%, it turns out. It doesn't work very well. So as we resize these pieces, we want to make sure that the viewport sizes the border layout container sizes this vertical layout container to actually put the pieces, uh, sorry, horizontal layout container to actually put the pieces where they belong. We want to make sure to keep passing sizes all the way down from parent to child, top down. Documents work exactly the other way around. You start with the individual words on the page. Each word makes up a sentence, makes up a paragraph. The paragraph takes up some amount of space. That paragraph then pushes its way up. Each of those paragraphs added together make the whole body. And the body works its way up. And if it runs out of room when it gets all the way to the parent, you have a scroll bar. Documents are a bottom-up layout. Applications tend to be top-down. And the really interesting part for us application developers, and interesting can be where you can really show off that you know what you're doing with this, or interesting can be why, oh, why won't it work? But the interesting part is where the documents meet the application. The application sizes its way down, and the scroll bars, or the empty white space, is the indication that you've met this borderland between document working its way up and application working its way down. If there is not enough space to display the full content in one of these little areas, which could be a grid, it could be a form, it could be some preview window, then you'll have scroll bars. And if there's extra space, then you can't grow into that area. If you have a form where you have three entries and you only need this much space, but I stretch to this much space, we don't want to be like the border layout container and occupy all the possible space. We just want to take the space we need and never grow beyond that. So, applications versus documents is all I have to say about layouts. I'm not going to show anything specifically because it's far too broad of a topic to get into that. We have a number of pieces of documentation on the thumb drives you've got that go through how to think in layouts, how to understand the basic HTML problem with building applications, and then it also digs into exactly what layouts do we support, what do they use, how do you configure them. Charts. Charts we talked about briefly before. You can assign axes, you can assign uh, series. We've got a number of different charts. I really encourage you to look at the examples to see exactly what we've got for this. They all bind to list stores. It's the same basic binding, same basic value provider mechanism we use everywhere else. Appearances and theming, I'm also not going to talk about much more here. Uh, if you missed the talk yesterday, it's going to be it was recorded and will be available online in the coming weeks. Uh, and then the slides will also be available. The slides and discussion on this mostly go through exactly what is the appearance pattern. There's, again, a small amount of discussion in the documentation you've already got there. But it doesn't go into exactly how to use the theme builder. The theme builder documentation is on the thumb drive already. There's some quick how-tos. There's some more comprehensive looks at what exactly you can put in a theme config file. And I'd be uh, interested in talking about this more as we move to the uh, one of the breakout rooms. So if you're interested in continuing the discussion, we're going to be in room three. Uh, it only fits about 30 people, so I'm not sure everyone's going to fit there. But uh, I, think we, I think we'll uh, take what we can get to see who can come in there, uh, what kind of material we can cover. And that may be wrong. I think we're actually room four. I think the intro to uh, uh, being a contributor for GWT is room three. So room four. Sorry about that. What's coming in GXT 3.1? This is something I discussed very briefly at the keynote. The theme builder is the main feature that we're excited about. How do we allow you to have one config file, around 200 lines of configuration, to specify every aspect of what the widths, heights, fonts, colors, borders, and then generate a jar file that has all these details? This will work automatically in all of your browsers, IE 8 and up, all the supported browsers. GXT4 then, we're going another step. We're trying to get uh, not only the ability to draw something that can work well on the tablet, but also something we can interact with. How do we worry about all the gestures and events? 
How do we uh, make sure we've got efficiently events being delegated, this global event delegation? How do we worry about scrolling? And then our tablet theme to say exactly how do we draw so it fits the device. Now it's up to you whether you use the device specific themes or whether, we're, um, whether you want to have a specific corporate logo or a specific corporate theme on all devices. Or if you want to go further and make Android look like iOS, iOS look like Android. We're not going to stop you, but we're going to provide the themes that enable you to do this however you'd like. We'll also have some specific charts that will work well in touch. Uh, this will allow you to use various inputs. It'll also draw them uh, more efficiently. We'll probably be trying to find ways to draw less items. Please don't draw, try and draw 10,000 items on a mobile screen and expect the user to interact with all of them cleanly. Anyone have to support ARIA for Section 508? OK. I don't need to talk about that right now, then. And left to right support, switching from uh, locales which, like English, writes from left to right, or other locales of languages I don't presently speak, which have to draw the other way around. This, uh, unfortunately, because I don't speak a language like this, and because many of us don't, it makes us somewhat uh, blind to the issues that come up when we don't reverse these things correctly. So it's something we're trying to focus on more, and now we've had some recent inquiries about it, and we're going to, uh, we're going to ship this as part of GXT uh, 4.0. Thank you. Any questions? We've got a microphone up here, if you can wait for just a moment to get to it. Otherwise, Tony and I will be moving to another room. I think Sven will be there as well. Yes, question here. And we'll be happy to answer questions there. We're specifically interested in getting people set up with the thumb drives you've got here in your development environment. So I used to um, use XJS and XGVT and uh, GVTX. Is it still related somehow? Are you doing same stuff? Are you copying? Is it related? They're vaguely related. So XJS is another library that's produced by Sencha uh, and predates GXT by a couple of years. There were originally two libraries, GWT EXT and EXT GWT, just for added confusion. <laughs> These were completely separate libraries. They solved the same basic purpose of providing widgets. GWT EXT was a wrapper around uh, XJS which works, but it does mean it's difficult to debug. And so uh, Sencha eventually decided to go with EXTGWT, which is now called GXT. And this library was written purely in Java. It was basically a re-implementation of the same basic features, but in GWT Java. That way the compiler could do as much as possible, and you could, edit it, you could debug as much as possible as easily as possible. Uh, we work with the XJS team, uh, not too directly, we are basically, each team is the other team's R&D. We do the problems of compiling, we do the problems of generating code, and they look at us and say, oh man, it'd be nice if we could do that. And so we slowly teach them how Client Bundle works there. They've almost re-implemented Client Bundle um, in, over, in their own tool, which we've had for the past three or four years. They've almost re-implemented cells, things that we've found to be very helpful. And then in turn, we steal lots of stuff from them. So if it was uh, Don Griffin or someone else from the XJS team up here talking instead, he'd be talking about how we've stolen various features from XJS. DOM structures, CSS, ways to make things draw very efficiently. They've gone through and figured out exactly how to draw all these things so that we can continue to support all the existing browsers, the modern browsers, and then begin moving into the touch world. So there's a lot of talk back and forth between the teams. We try to draw on each other's strengths and try to focus on our own platform-specific strengths. Other questions? Got one back here. Uh, two questions. Um, out of interest, how does the uh, JavaScript generated by GWT compare to the JavaScript, obviously the hand-coded JavaScript developed by these XJS guys? This is recorded. I don't want to get in lots of trouble with my colleagues. Um, the one place I've specifically looked for numbers is the charts, because we, we rewrote the charts from a specific JavaScript copy, uh, basically using our own brains, transpiled it into Java, and then compiled back to JavaScript. And then after we finished the first pass, we went through, and we looked for cases where strings were being used, um, and changed those to enums, or changed those to ints, to make sure we were uh, skipping any possible other steps we'd have to do along the way. It turned out that in the chart animation, they were taking strings, they were parsing them out into basically enums and ints every step of the way through the animation, causing just a little more overhead. On slower devices, our animation, 
excuse me, our animated charts vastly outperformed their animated charts. I believe we managed to convey this back to them and then they updated accordingly. Uh, to get much beyond that, I'm getting into trouble territory. So uh, we'd have to do some specific comparisons to see exactly what that looked like. Okay, also, I want to this this X, temp, this X template engine, was that developed in the house or was that an external product? And what was the, um, the, the motivation or the rationale for using that over UI Binder? Right. Complicated question. Um, X templates itself is a very old language as far as Sunch is concerned. XJS originally built it as a language and they had a JavaScript implementation. GXT 1 and 2 used the same JavaScript implementation and so we kind of worried about that, having this JavaScript based in the library. We also had some issues about the eval that was being called. Uh, anyone use the experimental closure compiler feature of Quit Compiler? Okay, it almost doubles the length of the compile, so a lot of people leave it turned off, but it does do a slightly better job about shrinking code. It's also totally incompatible with eval. If you use eval anywhere, you're in trouble. So we had that reason to want to get rid of it. We also had the reason that it wasn't, um, it wouldn't work very well with any POJO possible. We need to do some kind of runtime reflection to make it work correctly. So we switched to property access instead. We switched to having it auto-generate those property access pieces. Uh, I wrote most of the X template generator engine uh, with help from my colleagues, of course, in testing and figuring out exactly what other cases do we need to have and what did I forget to build, things like that. And we don't use it like UI binder because it isn't UI binder. We use both X templates and UI binders. They are very different purposes they're intended to fill. UI binder is meant to construct widgets individually, configure individual widgets, and then assemble them to one greater composite, the whole uh, view. In contrast, X templates are all about HTML. They're all about saying, let's let me write a document that looks like HTML, but is actually a string. But it's actually a string that's represented by code. And when it runs, it turns back into a string, and then I can inject it directly into the page. There's no widgets in X templates. The main goal is to be able to make things like cells very easy to write, so that way you can very easily write efficient code in your application. I think we're just about out of time. Any other questions? All right, if there are, let's take them to the other room. Like I said, it's gonna be room four uh, to continue the discussion and uh, start getting people uh, trying to get GXT running on their uh, own machines. So we'll be using these thumb drives, seeing if we can get you started, showing off the theme builder, things like that. Thank you for your time.